Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, activists. We speak with each one to one. From rubble to renewal to revolution, that sums up Community Board One's concerns since 2001. On September 10th, downtown Manhattan was a place to be if you wanted to be a financial player. You went to Windows on the World, Delmonico's, Bayard's, maybe even to Brooklyn to eat at Peter Luger's or to the River Cafe. But everything changed the next morning, now known simply as 9-11. As a result of what happened that day, New Yorkers reassessed their values, their sense of security and in invincibility, and from that awakening has come a new sensibility, a new neighborhood. Julie Minnan is chair of Community Board One, the founder of Wall Street Rising, a nonprofit dedicating to reviving Lower Manhattan after 9-11, and she was on the jury that decided what the World Trade Center Memorial site would look like. She embodies the spirit of the new downtown, and new it is. Welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. Great to be here. Julie, you were involved with Lower Manhattan long before 9-11 as, as a resident, a restaurateur, a lawyer. But was it 9-11 that turned you into a real activist, or we want, were one before that? Well, I think everyone has an <clears throat> activist element inside of them, but certainly what 9-11 did is it changed the direction of my life, of my community's life. I mean, not only were almost 3,000 people killed on 9-11, but there was a 16-acre hole in the heart of the neighborhood that I lived in, the neighborhood that I had my small business in. And I think when there is that kind of event, it causes people to act. Uh, for me, personally, I was supposed to be at the World Trade Center site on September 12th. I had a meeting there for my small business. Actually, we had a restaurant show that we were participating in. My husband was supposed to be at the World Financial Center the morning of September 11th. So we felt so fortunate, uh, personally, that we were not there at that time, but so many others were there. And there is a duty to get involved and to help and to rebuild in any way possible. And that is what I've spent the last 10 years doing. Now, what geographic area is covered by Community Board One? We are basically Canal Street South. So we cover the financial district, Tribeca, Battery Park City, and what is known as the Civic Center Seaport area. Okay, now just from my observations, uh, from riding along the bike path <laughs> yeah. through that area, it seems like a, a fairly affluent na neighbor area. Is that correct or parts, not? Parts of it are, certainly Battery Park City and parts of Tribeca. But we also, we have a very diverse community as well. We have the fastest growing residential neighborhood in the city of New York. We have 30,000 new residents that have moved into Community Board 1 since 9-11, which I think is an incredible testament to the power and perseverance of our neighborhood. But we are a diverse community with a lot of different neighborhoods and a lot of different individuals. Some are longtime Lower Manhattanites. Many others have moved to the community more recently. Now, I, I, I think I saw some poll recently that, that uh, where Battery, that listed Battery Park as one of the most livable, most desirable neighborhoods in the city? Yes, absolutely. And I think part of that is because of the access to the parks, the terrific public schools that are in the neighborhood, the waterfront access, the bike paths, recreational activities that Battery Park has, but also that other communities in Lower Manhattan have as well. One of the priorities that we've had is to really address any inequities between the east side and west side of our district. The east side of our district, just in terms of the development of the East River waterfront, has been an issue. Community Board One and the Downtown Alliance about uh, nine years ago did a visioning statement suggesting that the whole East River waterfront be developed so that our east side districts also had access to parks and bike paths uh, as well and playgrounds and activities for kids and for seniors. So what was it like the day on, on September 12th of 2001? Well, our community was devastated. I mean, it, I, I can't overemphasize what that moment was like. Uh, I was personally there on 9-11. My husband and I lived a couple blocks away from Ground Zero. My business was there. 
and it was a devastating time for all of us. We had military tanks in the street. The white grayish ash that covered our whole neighborhood was literally in every single pore and crevice. You couldn't get it out. And for those of us who stayed in the neighborhood, we kept cleaning our apartments. And in our apartment in particular, we found three times the EPA recommended level of lead even six to nine months after 9-11. It was so difficult to move on and to be able to rebuild, but we did rebuild. And I think that some of the challenges that we faced, and it was certainly not easy along the way, really speak volumes about what our lower Manhattan community is. We're a community of survivors, and we will be. And we went through a terrible, terrible time, but we were able to persevere and to rebuild our community. Now, did you and your husband have to leave the area for any time? We were evacuated <clears throat> on September 13th. It was interesting because we lived in the financial district and there were many office buildings that had been converted to residential use. The NYPD came around and evacuated all the buildings, but they never evacuated our building initially because they thought it was an office building and they didn't realize people were actually living there. Right. So we weren't evacuated until the 13th and then the NYPD came around and said the buildings next to, next to our building were unstable and everyone absolutely had to leave. We got back in as soon as we could, which was about four days later. Okay. okay. And then at the time, I decided to reopen my catering and restaurant business on the Monday after September 11th, which was the same time that the New York Stock Exchange decided to open. And I thought it was very important symbolically, even though our, my restaurant was devastated, the windows were blown out, my employees could not get to work, we were in the frozen zone, we couldn't get any food deliveries because, again, we were in the frozen zone. And, but we did reopen because it was important to show that no one was going to put us down. And so we went from having about 250 customers a day to three. Mm -hmm. Three people walked in that day. We served them pasta, which was all we had in the kitchen. But I think it was symbolically important that we did that. So practically speaking, what, were some, what did some of the rebuilding efforts entail? So about two weeks after 9-11, I started a not-for-profit called Wall Street Rising to try to rebuild the neighborhood. Eventually, Wall Street Rising had 30,000 members. We raised over $12 million to do programs within the neighborhood to help the community rebuild. We did arts programs. We did music programs. We built a downtown information center. We helped numerous small businesses move into the neighborhood. We helped businesses access government grants that were available to them. It was such a difficult time. No one know, knew at the time where to turn. It was really chaotic at that time and a very difficult time for residents and businesses downtown. How long were children out of school? Uh, it depended on the school. There were schools that were very close to the site where classrooms had to be moved and the effect on children is obviously now being documented but these children went through a terrible, terrible trauma. You talk about the fact that there was lead found in your house, what, six months later? So what did you have to do? Did you have to keep have people come in to clean it out and did people have to do this over and over again? Well there were grants available at the time <clears throat> for cleaning expenses but the problem is it didn't take one cleaning or even two or even three cleanings to really get that out and what we're seeing now ten years later is unfortunately hundreds and hundreds of residents who have become sick as a result of 9-11 toxins and um, thankfully the 9-11 health bill is now passed but in my opinion it's disgraceful that it really took so long to get passed and that people didn't do the right thing and protect the first responders and protect the residents. We have to remember that both the first responders and the downtown residents were told the air was safe to breathe by the federal government days after 9-11. We were told go back into your community. First responders were told to go to the site and many of them are sick and dying as a result and it's unconscionable. Now, we know that, they, they, that resp first responders are sick and dying. Are there also just residents who are sick? Uh, absolutely. There are many residents who have become sick. I mean, it is impossible for them not to, having breathed in those 9-11 toxins day after day after day and being told, oh, absolutely, the air is safe to breathe. There is an attendant duty on the federal government to then cover their health care costs. Now, what were some of the issues that the community board took on after 9-11, either advocated for or fought against or what? Well, there's so many. I mean, first of all, in the years right after 9-11, part of it obviously had to do with the cleanup, the removal of those toxins from the neighborhood, access to the neighborhood, because we were under a lockdown and, and frozen zone for a long time. And in some respects, we still are. There's so many streets that still are closed to vehicular traffic. Really? Downtown, there's still security checkpoints around the New York Stock Exchange, around Park Row, and other areas. So. We had so many concerns after 9-11, some obviously relating to health, others relating to getting the neighborhood back, and others relating, of course, to education. 
be, when this influx of residents came into our neighborhood, it created increased pressure on our public schools, which were already overcrowded to begin with. So we addressed that need by proactively finding sites in Lower Manhattan to build new schools. We at Community Board One did our own population studies. We sent out interns door to door to actually track the population growth in our community. And that is how we were able to convince the Department of Ed to build what is now PS 276, which was built last year in Battery Park City, the city's first green school, I might add, and also PS 397, which is a new school that was just opened up in the Gary Building in the seaport area. What's causing the population influx? So a couple reasons. First of all, in the years after 9-11, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation disseminated $227 million in grants for people to either remain in their apartment or for people to move to their apartment. The LMDC gave out grants to 40,000 residents, either existing residents or new residents, and those residents stayed. And many of those residents have young kids, and so that created the increased population boom in Lower Manhattan and the need to create new schools. Now, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, of which you, you were or are a board member. I am a board member. You are a board member. Yes. Um, was charged, with the, was given the primary responsibility for re rebuilding the area right. after 9-11. Um, how well do you think it's done its job? Well, the community board and myself in general have been critical of many of the aspects of the rebuilding process early on. We felt that there was a lot of fractious debate early on between the parties. And part of that was because anytime you have a city state agency, a bifurcated state agency, if you will, like LMDC, it, there's not one person in charge. There's not one person who says, I'm accountable and I take responsibility. Instead, there's a lot of finger pointing. And that is very frustrating for all of the stakeholders and the community at large. So we have been very critical of some aspects of that. We've also been very critical about the length of time it took to get some of the money out to the community groups who so desperately needed it. So about a year and a half ago, we found that the LMDC had over $200 million that people were not aware of. And we advocated very hard to get that money out to the community. And indeed, we were successful in getting LMDC to allocate all $200 million for community needs. We're going to take a short break. Then I'll be back with more with Julie Menon, Chair of Community Board One in Manhattan. Hi, I'm Matthew Goldstein. November is CUNY month and a great time to visit CUNY campuses in all five boroughs. Learn why more CUNY students than ever are winning national awards and scholarships. Our 24 colleges and professional schools are holding open houses for you. Meet world-class faculty, ask about financial aid. The time to start working on your future is now. Visit cuny.edu slash CUNY month. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Julie Menon, Chair of Community Board One in downtown Manhattan. Ground Zero is slated to be the site of four office towers, in addition to the memorial and the museum. I know that there was a big push after 9-11 where we're going to rebuild the, the, the Trade Center Towers to show the world that we cannot be brought down by terrorists. But there were others who said, well, you know, what downtown and the city in general really need is not more office buildings, but more affordable housing. Right. How do you feel about the way that the sort of the, the, the plans for the revival have turned out? Well, a couple different things. First of all, the overall master plan, I think, does not give enough emphasis to public components. It really gives a, overemphasis on the office buildings and not enough on really what the public at large can utilize. For example, the public can utilize a performing arts center. The public can utilize the retail. They can utilize park space. There should be more of an emphasis on those public components. In terms of affordable housing, we have urged the city and state to develop Tower 5 with 80-20 housing. And we have pushed very hard for that. That is a vacant parcel that is just south of the World Trade Center site. It's the former Deutsche Bank site. That tower is now down. And we have urged the city to build affordable housing on that site. We have to have a plan to build more affordable housing in lower Manhattan. It is absolutely critical. The community board just last month released our affordable housing report where we really surveyed all of the affordable housing that exists in community board one. And we need the city and state to really be focused on building more. 
There's also a lot of controversy over what the memorial part of the of the of the redevelopment would would be. I mean, I remember it, there were the debates went on uh, for for months about you know how would the deceased firefighters be listed uh, in the memorial. Um, I believe there were originally two museums that were planned, and one of them was scrapped. Um, how do you feel about how the memorial has turned out? Well, I think the memorial is a beautiful tribute to the lives that were tragically lost. I served on the jury that selected the memorial. We went through over 5,201 design submissions, and I think that Michael Arad's reflecting absence really encaptures those voids. He, with the idea of the waterfalls, they actually are voids. It's where those lives were lost. And one of the interesting things that, to me, is very important about Michael Arad's design is that it actually provides connectivity and access across the site. The majority of designs that were submitted to the jury actually suppress the memorial below ground, and people would have had to walk all the way around the site. And I think in an area, a dense area like Lower Manhattan, you need to be able to walk across the site. Our jury, when we selected Michael's design, then insisted that a landscape architect be involved, and we brought in Peter Walker. He planted 400 trees. So for those that have not been down to the memorial, I think that people would be pleasantly surprised at that element of it. It's actually a park that is larger than Bryant Park on the memorial site. Right now, you need tickets to get to the memorial, but eventually, in a couple of years, when all of the construction is done around the World Trade Center site, you'll be able to just walk across the memorial plaza. So if you want to go, for example, from Battery Park City to the Financial District or to Tribeca or in any of the lower Manhattan communities, you'll be able to walk right across that site. How, how much traffic has there been to the the memorial so far? So right now 7,500 people come to the memorial each day. That is wow. what the tickets are allocated mm -hmm. for. We are going to have approximately 7 million visitors each and every <laughs> year to the memorial. That has created challenges for the community. We were very actively involved on the plan for tour buses because we opposed a line of tour buses basically flanking our whole community. So we worked with DOT to modify the plan and make sure it's a plan that works really for the community so that we're not being walled off by lines of idling tour buses. Um, speaking of, of controversy, another one was the controversy over the, uh, the siting of Cordoba House, the uh, Islamic Cultural Center right. near, how, how far away is it from Ground Zero? It's three blocks. Okay. Um, the community board voted to in favor of its being there, yes. but it, the board was split. Oh, no, our board was no? not split. It was a 29 to 1 vote. Oh, I didn't know it that. It was oh. uh, overwhelmingly oh, in okay. favor of building the project. And that is because, first of all, we always need to stand up for freedom of religion. And this project was three to four blocks away from Ground Zero. It was not at Ground Zero, as had initially been reported by some press accounts. In addition, the mosque had been in the Lower Manhattan neighborhood for over 23 years, 10 blocks away from Ground Zero. So they wanted to move a site that was 10 blocks away to a site that was three to four blocks away. And I think it's very important that government not intrude on the rights of any religious group to practice as they see fit. Uh, another issue was uh, the plan by the Obama administration to hold one of the terrorist trials in New York City. I guess it would have been at the federal courthouse? It, yes, it would have been at the Foley Courthouse mm -hmm. in Lower Manhattan. They wanted to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11, at the Foley Courthouse in Lower Manhattan at the cost of $200 million of taxpayer money a year and involving 2,000 checkpoints in a neighborhood that was just starting to rebuild from 9-11. So we, the community board, opposed the plan. We suggested that the trial be moved first to Governor's Island, and then when the city did not support the Governor's Island move, we suggested that it be moved to the three upstate military locations, but that were still jurisdictionally within the Southern District of New York. And the idea really that was put forward that we had was that you don't have to have a, a trial in a federal courthouse. You can easily have a federal court judge preside over a trial in a non-federal courthouse location, such as uh, basically West Point is one of the issues that we thought would be good to look at. We also suggested Stewart National Air Base in Newburgh or the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Otisville. These were all locations within the Southern District and you could have easily had a civilian trial there. But the point was that we opposed the trial but that we tried to offer other locations that it could be moved at. And I think that's a very important point because so frequently when communities are upset about something that is happening in their neighborhood, they might hold a rally. 
And my opinion, having observed this for a long time and being a long-term community activist, is it's usually better if you have an alternative. If you say, we oppose this, but instead we think it should be moved to X, or we oppose this, but instead we think that Y should occur. And so it's a very solution-driven approach. Speaking of rallies, um, uh, one of the biggest story in the city in recent weeks has been the Occupy Wall Street yes. demonstrations. How do you feel about the demonstrations and about the way city officials have responded to them? So the community board, and we're having a meeting on this tomorrow night, our position has been we absolutely support the First Amendment right to protest and the First Amendment right to assemble. At the same time, we have tried to proactively address quality of life concerns because we have obviously many residents who live right next to Zuccotti Park and many small businesses as well. So we've tried to proactively address that. We have met many times with the protesters to talk to them in a proactive and responsive way about any issues that emerge. So whether those issues involve sanitation or noise or other quality of life issues, we've sat down with them numerous times to address that and I think those conversations have gone well. Of all of the efforts you have personally been involved in, uh, in, in, in trying to help bring Lower Manhattan back. What are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the fact that we've been able to build the new schools. We built two new schools, PS 276 and PS 397, and we just reached a deal about six months ago with the Department of Ed to build a school on Peck Slip. That will be three new public schools in four years. And when we really think what is our responsibility as community activists, I think it's really to leave our community and our city in a better place for the next generation. That is, to me, one of our fundamental responsibilities. And by building new schools, that is one way that we're able to address that. We're also very, very focused on affordable housing and making sure that the neighborhood is not priced out for teachers, for firefighters. We want to make sure that we have a diverse community of individuals that live in our neighborhood. So that's another issue that we're very focused on. And then I think we're also very proud of the fact that we have been able to take in extremely strong positions on issues of national resonance. When you think about the history of Lower Manhattan, it was the nation's first capital. It was a place in many instances of tolerance, but it's also been a place which has been the epicenter of some of the biggest national issues of our day. The idea of where Khalid Sheikh Mohammed should be tried. Should it be in a civilian trial as we put forward or should it be in a military trial? The issues regarding the Islamic Cultural Center, standing up for freedom of religion. The same for standing up for the right to protest, uh, for example, the Occupy Wall Street movement. We have faced, our, have faced our communities face some of the biggest issues of the day, right. and I think we've really stood up time and time again. What are you most disappointed by that you've seen happen? I'm most disappointed in terms of the overall redevelopment of a World Trade Center site just with the fact that we have had so much fractious debate from many of the different agencies and many of the players. I think it's so important that people really stand up and say, I take accountability and I take responsibility. And with the redevelopment of the site, it has been a very, very difficult process, in large part because there wasn't one individual who was in charge. We have dealt with a multitude of governors over the years, both in New York and in New Jersey. We've dealt with a, p a panoply of government agencies, an alphabet soup, if you will, of government agencies who all have a hand in the rebuilding. And that has been a frustrating experience. But the good news is that where we are now, 10 years later after 9-11, we're the fastest growing residential neighborhood in the city of New York. We're the fourth largest commercial business district in the country. We're one of the few areas in the city that actually has job growth. And I think that that's something that we all should be very proud of. Well, you know what they say about New York City. It takes about 60 agencies to get a public toilet <laughs> built. And th that's why we only have, what, three? <laughs> so um, how has the economic downturn affected that community? Has it Oh, it's, well, it's definitely affected everybody. It's, it's affected everyone throughout the city. It's put tremendous pressure on infrastructure. One of the things that we really believe should happen is that we should be uh, devoting more public sector dollars to large-scale infrastructure projects that actually create not only construction jobs but long-term jobs in terms of the demand for material and supplies and that have a multiplier effect in terms of creating new jobs. So that is something that is incredibly important to the neighborhood. And as we move forward, we want to write a new chapter for Lower Manhattan. We've been very lucky with our community. We have outstanding elected officials who represent our community. We work very collaboratively with all of our elected officials. And I think that we have a very strong community that has been extremely proactive about addressing issues as, as they present themselves. Well, I have no doubt that you're going to uh, continue to be very, a very forceful advocate for your community. 
and I want to thank you for joining us thank today. Thank you so much. Um, you can watch Julie Menon, you can watch her program, Give and Take, on WNBC's New York Nonstop Sundays at 7 p.m., and you'll also find the interviews online. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.